How's everyone doing? So my name is Jason and I'm a troublemaker. Are there troublemakers here? I just, I just want to make sure I came to the right place. And I brought my little friend, the stargazer Lily. You guys like this? So we're going to talk about buildings and we're going to talk about flowers a little bit. So um, while I am a troublemaker, I'm also an architect and I'm an environmentalist and I've been practicing green architecture before it was cool. And I had a lot of times early in my career when people thought that the things I was talking about was crazy and would never take off and no one would ever do this green stuff. We tried it in the 70s and it didn't work. <laughs> if you remember, those of you that are old enough, the 80s and the 90s, it wasn't kind to the green building scene. <laughs> but thankfully things began to change. Lead came along, green building started to become a mainstream topic, if not a mainstream activity, at least a topic. And we began to see some green buildings. But I began to be restless. I was anxious that the progress wasn't fast enough, that sustainability wasn't deep enough, that it wasn't authentic, that we were minimizing damage, but we were falling behind at all the real indicators and trends. So as an architect, we're taught to appreciate design and large buildings with glass and steel, but as my career went on, I began to be more frustrated with the progress of design, and more and more I turned my attention to nature's architecture, like this beautiful flower or the Gerbera that you saw earlier. And I started to compare these things in my mind, because they were both literally and figuratively rooted to place. If you think about your home or your office building, they're rooted to place. But unfortunately, that's where the comparison tends to end. You see, a flower has to get all of its energy from the sun through photosynthesis. It has to get all of the water that it needs from the amount of precipitation that it can capture in the root system below it. It has to be adapted very specifically to a place. It can't pollute the soil and the earth around it or it dies. In fact, when it's done, it becomes nutrients for the next cycle. And while it's alive, it responds actively to temperature and humidity. It opens and closes and tracks the sun and is actually habitat for lots of little critters, some that we see and some that we don't. And the kicker for me is that they're just so beautiful. Why can't this be a criteria for our buildings? Why can't this be the way we design? So I began working on this idea, a very crazy idea that became known as the Living Building Challenge, about a decade ago. And I started to think about this idea of how do we produce buildings that are not less bad for the environment, but are good for the environment? How about buildings that instead of being less likely to give us cancer, they can't give us cancer. How about buildings that instead of having less climate change impact and using a little bit less fossil fuels, use none? How about buildings that are, instead of being a little more efficient with water, get all the water that they need from the sky, capture it on the roof, bring it into the building, treat it, and use it again? Why can't we do these things that nature does? So I codified this in a 30-page document. And like anyone that has a 30-page document, I did the next crazy thing as I quit my job. <laughs> <laughs> I was the youngest partner in a very successful architecture firm. People, again, thought I was very crazy. I quit my job. I sold my house at a loss. I had a, you know, a young child who's here tonight, Aiden. Uh, and we moved to the, the West Coast and lived in a more expensive place, and I joined a nonprofit that had almost no budget and three staff. But I was going to launch the Living Building Challenge, and people said, Jason, you're crazy. This is too hard. Leeds already too hard. They thought, how are we going to do living buildings? How are we going to do buildings that will never have energy bills or water bills again, which is what I was asking. How are we going to do buildings that don't have toxic chemicals in them when we don't even know what's in our products? And I said, I don't know, but let's figure this out. Let's do this. And so this idea of the Living Building Challenge began to take root. And at first it was like, you know, a plant with a few seeds out there. 
A lot's happened in the last decade, and I'm excited to tell you that I've seen the signs of a revolution in architecture that's spreading around the world, and I'm really energized by it. We're seeing buildings that are radically more efficient, that do in fact get all their energy from the sun, all the water from the sky, that are free of toxic chemicals, that are helping local economies, and a host of other issues that we care about, that are beautiful. We just certified the Bullet Center in Seattle. How many people here have been to the Bullet Center? Probably a few. So if you want to do a solar building, the last place you'd think to do it <laughs> is in Seattle. <laughs> Especially a six-story Class A office building filled with you know, workers and computers and all the trappings of modern office buildings. But we've been tracking the performance of this building, and we actually generate more energy than we use on an annual basis with the sun. We're net positive. There's six stories of composting toilets in this building and no sewer connection. We produce nutrients. I like to tell people to please come take a crap in my building. <laughs> It's always good for a laugh. <laughs> the building out operates very much like a natural system. It has a central nervous system and a brain, and there's sensors throughout the building and outside the building. The windows automatically open and close, shades deploy up and down, lights dim and come up. The cooling system, or the heating system, actually it has no cooling system, it's completely naturally ventilated. The heating system comes on as needed, and so the building is always trying to find, like this flower, the best conditions for it to be in. So this building for us is really about rethinking everything. We worked with the city of Seattle to create new ordinances. A living building ordinance now happen, is, is happening in Seattle. And for me, what's amazing about this project is the impact that it's having on people. Now think about this for a minute. We just proved that in a market rate building, in the least sunny city in the lower 48 of the United States that's larger, the 90% of the buildings in our country, except for places like Midtown Manhattan, that we do not need fossil fuels, and it's cash positive. And here's where it gets better. We have now, this slide is already out of date, we have just about nine million square feet of projects like the Bullet Center going up around the world. People told me that this wasn't possible, right? Don't quit your job, don't think big. We have a sewage treatment plant. This is the most beautiful sewage treatment plant you've ever seen. <laughs> it's powered again by photovoltaics. It uses no chemicals to treat the water. It doesn't produce smell because it's an aerobic process. The butterflies fly around in the sewage treatment plant. It's beautiful. It produces nutrients. They even do yoga in the sewage treatment plant <laughs> and encourage you to breathe deeply. <laughs> it's a living building. There was a great team that did a living building project in Hawaii a few years ago, and they integrated all the technologies into the curriculum. They wanted to make sure that for the students, this was a new normal. The students learned about passive solar and green materials and healthy building, about gray water systems. They learned about active solar and photovoltaics and wind turbines, and this is part of the curriculum. And it's in the big island of Hawaii if you're interested in checking it out. And this is as it should be, where our children are in facilities that aren't filled with carcinogens and mutagens that use nature as its operating system, like this one. There's a story, if, if you've you know, maybe heard me talk about this, some of you probably, but I'd like to tell this story because this young lady impressed me more than just about anyone that I've ever met. I arrived at the building one day to, to check it out, and she offered, she was about 15, she offered to give me a tour, and she gave me a better technical tour than most architects could, because this for her was normal. She had been entrusted with the building. In fact, we went into the building, and she proceeded to show me how the whole system worked. Most of us here are afraid of your, you know, our thermostat at home. <laughs> Just admit it. 
And this young lady was not only knowledgeable enough to change the entire HVAC system, but she was empowered to do so, which was equally impressive. And now about a month ago, the state of Hawaii has decreed that going forward, every building, every school building in the state going forward is gonna use the living building challenge as its paradigm. We are seeing living building challenge projects all over the place, different climate zones, different building types. This is in Pittsburgh, incredible project, the Phipps Conservatory, incredible project. We're seeing existing buildings, including homes and historic renovation projects. This isn't just about building new. This is about everything, right? We need to retrofit the buildings we have to be living buildings. And this is a hundred year old net zero project in Ann Arbor. We're seeing incredible new research centers for sustainability coming online that are living building projects, Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I'm just showing you a few. If we had another six hours, <laughs> I could show you more. We have living buildings popping up in Australia that are very exciting, in Canada, where I'm from originally. Now this is where I wish my kids could go to day, uh, daycare, right? This is a living building project just outside Vancouver, Canada, that is incredible. Down in Mexico, we've got several projects emerging in Mexico, and this is a, a house project, and they have their own wetland sewage treatment plant as well that you see here. Valle de Bravo, it's called. It's very cool. Down in New Zealand, one of the most inspiring projects that I've seen, and it's been an honor to be attached to in any way, is the new parliament for the Tuhoi people in the North Island in New Zealand. And when they had an opportunity to build this new facility to bring the whole tribe together to help restore their culture, they knew they had to do a living building. Here in Bend, we have a living building house. We've started to scale this up we're start, starting to work with different communities around the country, around the world, on how we take these principles to scale, how we think about whole districts and produce living communities. Last year, we launched the Living Community Challenge officially. We're very excited as we're working with many communities now on figuring out how do we do this? How do we plan over the next few decades to move to living cities? It's very exciting. And we can imagine a time, this uh, image is kind of a fun one, no, this, isn't, this hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but imagine we got rid of nuclear energy and coal and, and had cities that were completely powered by the sun. This is the future that we need. We need it quickly, right? We need this quickly. And finally, we've moved on to trying to figure out how we make this change with products. The big barrier that we have is we still don't know what's in the things we buy, the things we put in our homes, the things we put in our offices. We don't know if they will make us sick. We don't know the hidden impacts upstream and downstream, the impacts usually on poor communities of the things we make and the things we buy. So this same thought process of asking the question, we don't want to be less bad. We want to figure out what good looks like. And just a month ago, we launched the Living Product Challenge. And now we're working with companies all over to begin to think about how do we do this? How do we create products where the manufacturing processes are powered completely by the sun, where they don't produce waste, right? Where they work within the water balance of their place, where they support local economies that are equitable, products that are not just thrown away, but truly good. It's gonna be a tough one, this one. <laughs> but it's what we need to do. And our hope is that we can create together a living future. And this is what we're really trying to do. I work for an organization called the Living Future Institute, and I'm hoping that all of you will become our members now. <laughs> and with that, I wanna thank everyone here and just think about next time you're doing your project, whether it's a home remodel, whether it's a new office building, that you can in fact do a living building. It's becoming real, it's scaling. The revolution is almost here. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.